Good afternoon. It's uh, 12 p.m., so uh, I suggest we start our session. Uh, I welcome you all to our book talk on punishment and private law. This is an event organized by the Obligations Lab Asia, a cluster of the Center for Comparative and Transnational Law at CUHK. Our guests today are Professor Eddie Spann from the University of Western Australia, Professor Kate Barnett from Melbourne Law School, and Mr. Martin Rogers, Hong Kong-based partner at Davis, Polk and Wardwell. My name is Norman Witzleb, and I'm delighted to be the host and moderator of this event. Over the next hour, we will introduce and discuss a new book on, private, on punishment and private law, edited by Elise Band, uh, Wayne Courtney, James Gaukamp, and Jean Marie Patterson. The role of punishment in private law has always been a matter of contention and often stirs up strongly held convictions. The controversies go much beyond the availability and proper scope of exemplary damages in the common law, although this is undoubtedly a central issue. Defining whether, and if so when, private law can be used to punish a wrongdoer requires us to come clean on fundamental questions about the function, boundaries, and interactions of private and criminal law. It also requires us to define the appropriate relationships between private rights and uh, the protection of public interests. The book Punishment and Private Law is a treasure trove for readers who are interested in cutting edge research on these perennial questions. The editors have assembled a fantastic group of common law scholars to grapple with these issues from a range of perspectives. I limit myself to saying only a few words about the book. It covers the whole breadth of the subject. After an introduction that highlights the major themes of the debate, it deals with the history, theory, and concepts of punishment in private law. The doctrinal issues covered in the collection include the role of punishment in the law of fiduciaries, in the law of contempt, and in the protection of privacy. Appropriately, issues relating to punitive damages are given particular prominence. Two of the chapters discussing the need for proportionality in effecting deterrence and the availability of exemplary damages in contract law, respectively, we will hear more about in the session today. Other contributions deal with recent judicial developments in the law of agreed punishment and the penalty rule in uh, contract law, contractual limits and punishment, and a diverse range of other issues. In my view, it's particular strength of the collection that it doesn't only deal with these issues on their own terms, but it, that it seeks to synthesize uh, the discussion and provide a more coherent account of punishment in private law. Even in a jurisdiction such as Hong Kong, which has endorsed the English quite restrictive approach to exemplary damages, the comparative discussion will be of significant practical relevance. The analysis provided in this collection will promote a better understanding of the role that punitive elements should have in today's common law doctrines. So I encourage you all to pick up the book and I'm grateful that Hard Publishing has agreed to provide a 20% discount to audience members who wish to purchase it. The discount code is on the slides uh, uh, on, on your screen. So let me briefly explain the uh, sequence of today's session. The two presentations by Elise Band and Katie Barnett will each be for about 15 to 20 minutes. This is followed by a comment provided by Martin Rogers. In the last 10 minutes, you can ask questions of our speakers. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to, at any point during the session. I will then read out your question and ask the speakers to respond. Elise, Katie and Barnett, with your permission, I'll keep the introductions quite short. There's more fulsome bias on many of your achievements on the event website. Okay, Elise. You're a professor of private law and commercial regulation at the University of Western Australia and an Australian Research Council fellow on a project of uh, corporate uh, responsibility for wrongdoing. You're one of the book's editors and the co-author of two chapters. You will speak to us today on effecting deterrence through proportionate punishment, an assessment of statutory and general law principles. Over to you, the floor is yours. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Norman. And it's an absolute delight to join you in Hong Kong today uh, for this uh, terrific event. As Norman indicated, I'll be talking with you about the chapter which I co-wrote with Professor Jeannie Marie Patterson on affecting deterrence through proportionate punishment and assessment of statutory and general law principles. As the name gives away, there are two essential uh, thrusts to our chapter. The first is that the civil law uh, has as a legitimate aim, the goal of affecting specific and general deterrence of wrongdoing, but it does so through trying uh, using uh, punitive uh, uh, considerations, uh, elements and effects. Um, that is, punishment need not be seen as an aim of civil law um, in order for punishment to be seen as a useful tool to affect uh, genuine and appropriate uh, civil law aims. And deterrence is one of those aims. Um, I should say uh, also that a key uh, issue here is, well, we can use punitive conceptions perhaps, but how do we make sure that we keep them proportionate? How do we make sure that they are adapted and appropriate for the civil context? So that's a key uh, focus of this chapter. The other key focus is the consideration of statutory and general law principles. Um, here, perhaps uh, Jeannie and I are slightly unusual in that we've always considered that we should consider strongly the statutory principles that are manifested or revealed uh, in longstanding statutory um, instruments uh, or perhaps across a range of different statutory in instruments. And particularly in Australia, that's been a very fruitful line of research because we have overarching statutes that prohibit, for example, misleading conduct, uh, unconscionable conduct, dishonest conduct, those sorts of things. And in the punitive area, we have um, very uh, strong use of civil pecuniary penalties. Uh, they're kind of fine, uh, pecuniary fine, which is meted out for a range of uh, civil forms of misconduct. Now that's important because in Australia, at least, there's no sharp divide between uh, concepts of uh, deterrence and um, penalty uh, orders. Um, and Australia has been fertile ground for the development of, you know, rich jurisprudence about the role of punishment in affecting deterrence. Uh, so that's one of the hallmarks, I suppose, of the Australian um, experience. Uh, in the chapter, uh, Jeannie and I um, traverse um, a range of jurisdictions in which we note that there seems to be a trend emerging uh, broader than Australia uh, which recognises the importance of having remedies and orders to hand for courts, which are effective to deter civil wrongdoers and those who might be minded to act similarly to them from committing serious misconduct. Now, in the statutory sphere, there have been a range of quite interesting developments. For example, statutory orders uh, uh, to um, uh, for for. Uh, companies to be subject to performance scorecards, which is an interesting idea, often on an annual basis and showing how the corporation uh, has um, acted, uh, judged against various uh, corporate standards of good conduct. Uh, others are adverse publicity orders, corrective advertising audience orders, multiple and additional damages award, um, and statutory damages expressly aimed at specific and general deterrence. Now, those sorts of statutory um, orders, which might be considered to be more um, uh, creative in nature, sit alongside and in many ways complement the general law orders that also can be applied to effect deterrence. So if we think about some of those more traditional remedies, um, not only do they combine things such as exemplary or punitive damages, but you also have the equitable account of profits, um, costs orders can quite often deter wrongdoing, uh, very painful they can be. Uh, more generous ways of calculating compensatory damages, for example, in respect of the tort of deceit. Um, the tort of deceit applies um, remoteness rules that are designed to uh, encourage 
uh, wrongdoers not to engage in this form of activity. So for example, remoteness rules uh, in deceit tend to uh, capture intended or direct loss, even where that loss is not reasonably foreseeable. Uh, other rules, for example, the exclusion of contributory negligence considerations go along the same route. So this trend suggests an ongoing appreciation of the importance to civil law of supporting deterrence through punitive concepts and elements. The basic idea here is that orders must sting if they're going to be effective to deter. But the question is, well, how do you make sure that punishment used to promote deterrence is proportionate and not excessive, particularly given we're dealing with civil uh, cases? So our thesis in the chapter is that principles of proportionate punishment can and must be articulated. And what we seek to do is to show how, uh, at least in the context of profit oriented orders, uh, considerable guidance can be obtained for what proportion, proportionate punishment looks like from the equitable remedy of an account of profits. Now, this is very valuable in the Australian context because as I said, we have a widespread jurisdiction to impose civil pecuniary penalties, uh, but courts have been uh, slow to take into account profits that have been obtained from uh, breaches of the statutory uh, prohibitions, for example, the prohibitions on misleading conduct and unconscionable conduct, they've been slow to take into account the profits that have been obtained from that wrongdoing. They've tended to emphasise uh, loss and the need to deter, but only to take into account punitive considerations um, in through mitigation factors, like, for example, uh, taking into account a wrongdoer's contrition or remorse. So uh, this uh, uh, jurisdiction of an account of profits in the context of the equitable remedy is uh, really a rich source of insight, we think. Um, and it's particularly uh, important now in Australia because we have new statutory reforms that emphasise profit as a relevant consideration. Uh, but that simply raises the question, well, what does profit mean and how do we uh, measure it? You know, what kinds of connection does it have to have to the wrongdoing? Now here, the Australian High Court of uh, Australia decision um, in uh, Ancient Order of Foresters and Life Plan in 2018 uh, is of particular interest. It sets out what we contend to be a very sensible and clear structured way of analysing how an account of profits should work in a way that will really be effective to uh, achieve general and specific deterrence. Now, very briefly, it, the case concerned corporate accessorial liability for knowing assistance in a breach of fiduciary duty. Um, I just pause there to note that, of course, the fact that this was a fiduciary duty case doesn't mean that the kinds of considerations that it uh, raises about the relevance of profit for deterrent awards couldn't be used more broadly, particularly in our statutory context, which, uh, you know, points to profit now over a range of different areas. So this was a case where the defendant was an accessory to a breach of fiduciary duty. They, uh, Mr. Uh, Woff and Mr. Corby were the people who owned, owed the fiduciary duties to their employer life plan. In concert with the defendant, Foresters, who was a competitor of life plan, they used their employer's confidential information and business opportunities to draw up a five-year plan for development of a competing business for Foresters. Now this nefarious plan was spectacularly successful. Foresters enjoyed a huge uptick in business at the expense of life plan. Now I'm going to focus on the joint reasons of uh, Chief Justice Kiefel, Justices Keane and Edelman in the High Court. They said that the liability to account and disgorge profits obtained in breach of fiduciary duty as a result of that participation uh, fell into a number of clear stages. So first, the profit has to have been caused by the breach. Now, on this question of causation, 
there's a really important and I think underappreciated point that comes out of the judgment, which is that here, but for the but for test, the usual one that we're so familiar with, is not necessarily the only or the only appropriate approach. So the High Court uh, plurality says that if the misconduct was an inducement, that it was a factor in bringing about the benefit or advantage enjoyed by the defendant, that this may suffice. Now, this is very important because, of course, if the plaintiff has an onus of showing that but for the uh, uh, breach, um, they uh, would have um, enjoyed or the defendant would not have enjoyed certain benefits, the way is open for a defendant to raise all sorts of spurious counterfactual examples of circumstances where it may or may not have enjoyed uh, some of those uh, benefits. Now, what the High Court says is, look, we don't have to try and pass those uh, contributing factors. It's enough if the uh, breach caused or contributed to the benefit and or advantage that has been enjoyed by the defendant. The second question is, well, how do we work out what the benefit is? Uh, the key issue here was whether the court should order an account of the net present value of certain contracts that had not yet fully matured, that is future profits. The other question facing the court was whether Foresters, which was the defendant, should be required to account for its entire capital value of its business or just the five years head start, which it enjoyed as a result of the nefarious plan, which it had successfully put into action. Here, the court's approach was to assess benefit very generously, capturing all gross revenue and unrealized profits. So basically all benefits uh, obtained um, as a result of the breach of uh, fiduciary duty um, or the accessory to be breach of a fiduciary duty uh, were liable to be captured. So this is a very wide net. Now the trick here is that once we've identified the sum total of the advantages obtained from the breach, the onus then flips onto the defendant to justify why it should be allowed to retain any of those advantages. Now, this is a huge step forward, I think, because it puts all of those tricky sort of allowance and offset considerations that have often bedeviled um, courts of equity in assessing an account of profits. It puts all of that hard work on the wrongdoer, which seems in a very effective strategy. Now here, there are really only two ways that a defendant can obtain uh, or retain any of its improperly obtained benefit. The first way is to have an allowance permitted for uh, costs incurred or skill or labor uh, uh, that has been employed to generate the profit. Now, we can understand that very fairly easily as operating to prevent the unjust enrichment of the plaintiff who would otherwise claim the benefit of the defendant's labor without paying anything for it. Of course, the implication of that is that if an allowance is disallowed, the award starts to look quite punitive indeed because nothing is being allowed at all for the defendant's um, cost or labor. The second way of showing the, the limits, if you like, on um, the uh, uh, benefits that must be disgorged to the plaintiff is to show that the benefit or some part of it is beyond the scope of the liability uh, for which the wrongdoer should account for the profits. Now that language of scope of liability is employed very deliberately by the plurality. Uh, this is, in effect, a remoteness rule for profits, just the same as we have remoteness rules for compensatory orders. And indeed, what we argue is that uh, when you look closely at the reasoning of the court, the remoteness rule that they adopt is the same one as we see for deceit, for compensation for uh, deceit. So remember, I said that for compensation for deceit, 
uh, the remoteness rule is that all intended or direct loss is recoverable, even if it's not reasonably foreseeable. In this case, the plurality said, well, you know, we think that the scope of liability shouldn't capture uh, uh, benefits that have no reasonable connection with the breach. And when addressing, well, what does that mean? What does a reasonable connection require? Remembering that we've already dealt with the causal question, uh, the factual causal question. Um, the answer to that is, well, if the profit or the benefit was intended to result from the breach, then it's not too remote. It's not outside the scope of liability. And here, um, all the uh, uh, new business of the of foresters on an ongoing basis was intended. And so the court, the plurality said, well, all of that profit can be captured um, and uh, it shouldn't be limited to a five year period. So this was a very profound um, and significant order, uh, which had a radical uh, effect upon the scope or the size of the disgorgement award. Uh, finally, in just uh, concluding, I just note that I have been having um, a great deal of fun looking at um, Hong Kong decisions concerning account of profits and exemplary damages. And I came across an absolutely terrific judgment of uh, Justice Hon Ma in um, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Court of First Instance um, in 2003, which contains a marvellous uh, discussion of account of profits in which uh, the learned judge uh, emphasises the fact that accounts of profit are subject to scope of liability and remoteness rules, just like um, compensatory uh, remedies are. So there you go. Hong Kong is way ahead of the ball ballgame. Uh, was talking about these things long before Australia. But I think that that's a very useful um, idea that we have this strategy of identifying um, all of the effectively the gross revenue generated from uh, or uh, generated from a breach, that we use an A factor test rather than but for to capture all uh, benefits to which the uh, breach contributed. Uh, the onus then shifts onto the defendant to show why they should be allowed to retain any of that advantage. And the only ways that they can do that is through two ways. One is to show that the loss, the profit falls outside the scope of their liability. And the other way is through an order effectively for counter restitution of the value of their services. Um, those are very limited uh, means. So uh, there you go, shows a wonderful way of um, holding um, wrongdoers to account and a really good template, I think, for civil pecuniary penalties jurisprudence in the statutory sphere. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elise. Uh, it's been wonderful how you compressed, you know, so you're incredibly rich chapter into, you know, just under 20 minutes and also made us feel good about Hong Kong jurisprudence. So thank you so much for it. Um, I move on to uh, Katie Barnett now. So Katie Barnett, as I said, is a professor at Melbourne Law School. She's written extensively on many aspects of uh, private law and is the co-author of Australia's leading textbook on remedies law. I look forward to your talk on exemplary damages in contract law now. Okay, so thank you so much, Norman and Elise for having me and Martin for commenting on our book. I'm just going to share some slides now. So I thought it might be a bit easier if I um, shared some slides to give you a bit of a roadmap of how um, my uh, chapter works. So what I'll be concentrating on today is exemplary damages in contract law. And obviously, as many of us will be aware, exemplary damages are not generally available for breach of contract in most common law jurisdictions apart from Canada. Um, recently and fascinatingly, the Singapore Court of Appeal has confirmed mostly 
exemplary damages are not available for breach of profit, but then tantalizingly, they said they would not rule out entirely the possibility of exemplary damages. And I've put the case there, it's pH hydraulics. So what I think I'll have a look at first is the history. Um, so, oh no, I'll look at when they're available, then I'll look at the history, then I'll look at the motivations. So, if they are available for breach of contract exceptionally, when? That's what my chapter looks at and it, it's summarised on this slide. Basically, if you've got any, any, any other kind of remedy available, you should take that because exemplary damages are really, they don't sit particularly well with contract. So mental distress damages, reasonable fees, account of profits for breach of contract, of which I'm a fan, um, all of this should be awarded in preference to exemplary damages. The second thing is that the defendant's conduct must be malicious and egregious, not just commercial brinksmanship. And I think because contract is generally self-interested, it has to be particularly malicious. And finally, the plaintiff must have a legitimate interest in ensuring how the contract is performed. And I'll explain what I mean by this because, you know, legitimate interest tests. I often shake my head a little bit and say, but what does it mean? I'm going to explain what I mean. So this is where we get to the history of exemplary damages. One reason why we don't get exemplary damages in contract is, of course, historical. So exemplary damages are, in a way, overlaid um, with tort and its roots in the criminal law. So in England, back in medieval times, the criminal law and tort were not so separated as they are now, and that's why tort retain some vestiges of punitive aspects. And as you would all know, English law um, has not only limited the availability of exemplary damages to tort, but further to three categories outlined in Brooks and Barnard. Um, oppressive, arbitrary or unconstitutional acts by servants of government, cynical profit making, where authorised and where authorised by statute. And Hong Kong is the only other um, common law jurisdiction which has accepted this in an unqualified manner. I do acknowledge here um, that it is difficult to argue for exemplary damages for breach of contract where Wooks and Barnard is accepted. However, if I had a message for the Hong Kong Court of Appeal, it would be um, reconsider Rooks and Barnard. Um, regardless of whether you want exemplary damages for breach of contract or not, reconsider it. Anyway, that's another story. Um, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and Singapore have all rejected Rooks and Barnard. And instead what they do is they focus on the quality of the defendant's conduct. You don't have to fit into those three categories so in Australia, for example, you have to show a contumelious disregard, for example. So that's our historical background. Now what I want to talk about is the normative basis of exemplary damages. And in order to explore this, I looked at the very old case of Wilkes and Wood, a defamation case actually, um, where uh, Lord Chief Justice Pratt said exemplary damages are designed not only as a satisfaction to the injured person, but likewise as a punishment to the guilty, to deter from any such proceeding for the future, and as proof of the detestation of the jury to the action itself. So we can see from this, we can pull out from this three elements, some kind of aspect of desert of retribution, of punishment. Secondly, some kind of aspect which overlaps with what Elise was talking about of general and specific deterrence. And then thirdly, um, 
there is a declaratory and vindicatory aspect where the court is saying, we don't like this conduct and the public doesn't like this conduct. What I'm going to illustrate in my next part of this talk is that these normative aims kind of conflict with the general aims of contract itself and don't sit very happily with contract. So, um, generally, of course, with contract, a breach of contract is not regarded most times as a moral wrong and may in fact sometimes be tolerated or even desirable. And Selene Rowan, who also um, contributed an excellent chapter in this volume, has said that contract is tolerant of a certain amount of self-interested behaviour. And the Singapore Court of Appeal in that pH hydraulics case said that really it's up to the parties to determine what happened. It's not up to the court. And contract generally issues punishment. In other words, we don't really like, we don't like people putting penalties in contracts. If parties can't stipulate penalties, why should the court be able to do so? So what I'm going to do now is go through each of the rationales in Wilkes and Woods and see how it sits with contract. Okay, so let's think about the concept of retributive desert and contract. This does not sit well. So generally, as we've just said, the willfulness of the breach is irrelevant and whether the breach was deliberate or not does not generally matter. And the remoteness rules are the same regardless. However, in my chapter, I do pull out some cases where I think the willfulness of the breach is important to the measure of the damages the court awards. And I compare, for example, two building rectification cases, TABCOR, where the breach was willful and full rectification damages were awarded, and Ruxley Electronics, the English case, where the breach was accidental and um, loss of amenity damages were awarded instead. Another case, of course, is Attorney General and Blake, the case where an account of profits was awarded for breach of contract. So, um, there may also be ways to see breach of contract as a moral wrongdoing. And I outlined the way in which um, Singaporean scholar Paywell and Lee has um, analysed contract in that kind of way. But as James Penner notes in his chapter in this volume, just because something is a moral wrong doesn't necessarily mean it's a legal wrong. So I do think there must be a reason specifically to see the breach of contract as a legal wrong. Now, let's see how contract sits with the notion of deterrence. Okay, so we've already established contract is self-interested. Um, it allows you not only to enter into a contract, but also to get out of it. Um, one might say, well, Deterrence is not part of the law of contract, particularly given the rule against penalties. And this is something the Court of Appeal raises in pH hydraulics. Um, I actually think the rule against penalties has less bite um, in the UK, Australia and New Zealand, because they say, as long as the penalty is in proportion to the contracting party's legitimate interest, it's okay whereas uh, Singapore has kept the dumb mop test. Um, and then what about efficient breach? Some people say, well, you can't um, have accounts of profit or exemplary damages because you might deter efficient breach. Okay, I have issues with efficient breach. It makes overstated claims. It kind of presumes a state of affairs which isn't true and might not even be correct on its own terms. However, I do think, following Daniel Friedman, that there is room for tolerated breach and we should leave room for that, which is why we have to be really careful. Um, and then finally, we have normative com conflict, um, conflict between contract and the declaratory theory of punishment. 
So the whole idea of exemplary damages is in part to stop people taking um, self-help in revenge once they've had a tort committed against them. Let's give them some money so that they don't go beat up the other side. And originally, um, it was stated that it was to prevent duelling. Um, obviously, this doesn't really operate in contract. I don't know that contracts terribly often give rise to duels, but there might sometimes be situations where it's necessary to maintain the importance of contracting properly as a social practice. So what I've tried to show here is that the normative aims of exemplary damages and the normative aims of contract don't sit together terribly well, but there might be some situations where sometimes it might be okay. So let's get on to my scheme, my wicked scheme. Um, so. I suggest in my chapter, somewhat controversially, that sometimes we, we might want exemplary damages for breach of contract, but we would need for um, certain things to be made up. Firstly, other remedies must be unavailable or wholly inadequate. Secondly, the breach must be malicious and egregious. Thirdly, um, the plaintiff must have a legitimate interest in performance. And fourthly, to allow the breach must undermine the institution of contract itself. And the court must identify some kind of public policy reason. I do think this also kind of squares nicely with Elise and Jeannie's chapter, um, where it's very much about identifying policy reasons why we should enact proportional um, punishment and I found their chapter very helpful. So what I did was I looked at the cases and I found that it actually fitted my, my scheme pretty well. Um, and you can look in the chapter to see the table I went through. So, but let's go through each of the factors and then I'll finish up. So firstly, other remedies have to be available or not adequate. So this includes anything, 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 anything. Compensatory damages, distress, reasonable fees, specific performance, accounts of profit. I thought that the legitimate interest test of Blake might be adapted to show the circumstances in, what, in which such an award might be necessary. So I have written on Blake quite extensively. And one situation where I think it's necessary is an agency problem case, agency problem in the economic sense where one party has all the power and information, but it's in their interest to breach and the other party bears all the risk and has none of the power and information. And typically this is a negative covenant case. However, even if there is an agency problem situation, if another remedy is available, that should be awarded. Then what about malicious, dishonest or fraudulent? Well, I saw malicious as having a subjective element, malice, right? Egregious, I think, has an objective aspect where we, we kind of look at it and we think, oh, that's not good. Um, in most of the cases where exemplary damages have been awarded in Canada, it's actually been more than that. It's been up near fraud or in fraud, really. They're really pretty bad cases. But even fraud and malice by itself is not enough. Then the legitimate interest, what do I mean? Well, I think what you have to have is that situation where one party, the breaching party, has all the power and information and the reason to breach, and the other party is kind of at their mercy in one way or another. They don't have power or information and they bear all the risk. And another thing, um, drawing on TABCOR, uh, actually, some kind of contemporaneous expression of dismay might also um, help show a legitimate interest. In the TABCOR case, the contracting party, Mrs. Bergman, comes into the uh, foyer of her building and begins to sob as she sees that TABCOR has destroyed it. 
Conversely, in Ruxley, they bring up the issue of, oh, you didn't build the swimming pool right on the last day of trial as an aside. So it kind of suggests how important was this really to you? Finally, I do think it's important to identify a public policy reason. And we could in fact, you know, look to statute for guidance for some of the things which were important. So, um, and the breach must be of a nature that declaratory punishment is necessary. I also kind of played with the idea that maybe exemplary damages for breach of contract could be a bit like a canary in a coal mine, right? So if a court needs to award exemplary damages for breach of contract, this really shouldn't occur. It's a sign that the legislature needs to get involved and maybe regulate this kind of conduct rather than the courts having to do it because I am more comfortable with the statutory scheme such as the one Elise suggested. So um, I think I'm still in time, yep. So um, really that's my chapter in a nutshell. I look forward to hearing all your questions and I'm just so grateful to be here with you all today. Thank you, Katie. Well, we're grateful for uh, you to share your insights uh, on the, this field and also your, you know, your, your attempts to bring a little bit more order and, and structure into the case law. Uh, so I'm sure there will be questions uh, you know, later on, you know, but now I would like to move on to uh, Mr. Martin Rogers, partner and chair Asia at Davis Polk and Wardwell, and one of Asia's leading litigation, financial services, regulatory and corporate governance lawyers. Martin, I look forward to your comments. Norman, thank you so much. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, can. Look. Uh, first, let me say I'm a practical guy, so I need to say, given what I'm about to say, that I have not been paid or influenced in any way to say this. This is a wonderful book. Um, it, I, I was surprised by how wonderful I found it because Hong Kong is such a traditional conservative jurisdiction, and uh, I'd always thought that the chances of a case deci decision like Rooks and Barnard being overturned in Hong Kong were very low. Um, but, you, you know, with this, the quality of this book and the analysis it contains, um, and, and, and if it gets into the hands of the Court of Final Appeal, as, I, as I'll come on to, I intend it should, will happen soon, um, I think there's a real prospect of this book helping Hong Kong's jurisdiction going forward as, as, as one of the um, common law jurisdictions which has not advanced, particularly um, in, in, in these areas, in the way that Australia and New Zealand um, and have and, and, and the US, I guess, uh, and Singapore and the US, I guess, was already there, but in coming from a different um, different historical background. Um, it's a wonderful book in that it's a, it is a collection of individually written chapters, but they are, as you indicated, Norman, brought together in a very comprehensive and well structured way. And um, it pretty much covers everything you could think of and and more. I mean, it's got a very useful section on contempt of court, for example, which um, is another dimension of the uh, the dichotomy or and, and interrelationship between private law, compensatory remedies on the one hand and criminal law and punishment um, on the other. So, so look, in, in the in the sort of um, 10 minutes or so I've got, I, I wanted to highlight briefly from a Hong Kong law perspective four or five points and, and not surprisingly they they overlap substantially with the the great um, uh, presentations that we've just had the privilege of hearing. Um, first, Rooks and Barnard, um, is, there a, is there a real chance that with the help of a, a book like this and the argument it contains that it that it might be overturned? Um, you know, for just, just to note, um, uh, as I think was indicated in Elisa's slides, um, you do have uh, two, at least two, um, yeah, in fact, two, every year there are decisions citing Rooks and Barnard. The, the, the two, uh, you had one earlier this year, which then went back to the Allen, on, Allen versus Ungham Co judgment, which was a strong judgment of the Court of, of Appeal, uh, led by Mr. Justice Falk, who's obviously now in the, the Court of Final Appeal, in endorsing the distinction between um, punishment and compensation uh, and endorsing the categorization set out in 
in Rooks versus Barnard. But if you, I, I would commend everybody to read in particular um, the chapters two by Kit Barker and chapters nine by, by Katie Barnett, um, pointing out, as, as Katie puts it, the arbitrary and, and absolute, the, the, the Rooks and Barnard's categories just are arbitrary and lack logic. So as a starting point, if, 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 a, if something is arbitrary and lack, lacks logic, one would hope that the Court of Final Appeal, if a case comes before it, would recognize that. The second point is that the, the Allen and Ungen Co decision is a decision of the Court of Appeal. It's not a Court of Final Appeal decision. So there is scope for the, the Court of Final Appeal to come and re revisit this. I, I would also say it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be out of line with the trend, um, uh, the trend in Hong Kong of beginning to recognize that maybe the dichotomy between private and private law and punishment is, 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 not, that, is not that bright. Uh, bright line. Um, so, so first, if you look at Allen versus Unco, it is also authority for the proposition that non-pecuniary loss may already include hurt feelings and mental distress. Um, it does uh, characterize that, uh, th those additional damages in terms of uh, compensatory to mark the aggravation of damage suffered by the plaintiff by reason of the defendant's conduct. But, but that is a movement in the, uh, in the direction that's being discussed in the book. Um, secondly, um, very recently this year, um, uh, again, I think as, as, as has been noted, we have had Cavendish when it comes to um, the, the rule against penalties and, and limiting the, uh, the scope of the rule against penalties, um, the attack on liquidated damages clauses. Cavendish has been upheld um, in two cases now in, in Hong Kong, one only just over a month ago called China Great Wall AMC International Holdings Company Limited versus Royal Bond Investment. And then that cited an earlier decision, Law Ting Pong Secondary School versus Chen Wai Wa. Um, so we are seeing in Hong Kong, and, and I can confirm as a practitioner, this is certainly the case in arbitration cases, a trend towards limiting as much as possible the scope of the rule, rule against penalties. Uh, that, that, that trend takes two forms. Firstly, there's a judicial or arbitral reluctance to characterize contractual provisions uh, as involving an assessment of liquidated damages. And secondly, we're seeing a general reluctance to interfere with the party's in, um, assessment of, of what is an appropriate level of, of damage in, in such circumstances. Uh, I mean, this leads me on to a point which I do feel very strongly about and, and, and was just covered in the last presentation. Um, in this part of the world, in Asia, parties in commercial relationships, they behave unethically and often outrageously so, in, including dishonesty. Dishonesty, in my experience as a practitioner, there's very little reluctance to violate clear contractual provisions if the calculus is that ultimately the worst that may happen is an award of compensatory damages, uh, which may well fall far short of the benefit that the violating party is going to achieve in the meantime and I'm dealing with just such a case at the moment and I'm going to uh, borrow Katie's excellent work to introduce a claim of exemplary damages probably as an alternative to a, uh, a restitutionary type claim uh, as a supplement to the damages claim but I am going to include it and, and I think it would be very helpful um, if uh, courts and arbitral tribunals in Hong Kong would consider expanding the, the scope for exemplary damages in, 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 in contract. You can sometimes use fiduciary relationships, um, obviously, but, but the way Hong Kong is moving commercially um, is, is, is in a direction which means that it's actually becoming harder to establish fiduciary relationships. One example is the new Hong Kong Limited Partnership Fund Ordinance, which sort of copies the exempt limited partnership structure found in the Cayman Islands. Um, th that structure, if you look at it, uh, goes out of its way to, to negative fiduciary relationships in, the co in a context where you would normally expect to see fiduciary relationships, namely, namely fund management. And, and I hope that Katie's work in particular, supported by Elise's work, with, particularly with the Singapore Court of Appeals decision in PH Hydraulics, Will start, we will start to see where appropriate exemplary damages are ordered under Hong Kong law. I can see it happening in arbitrations um, for a number of reasons. Um, that They have to deal with outrageous contractual violations often. Uh, members of tribunals in Hong Kong often have arbitrators with a US background. Uh, 
Um, having said that, if one's looking at a, 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 a um, principled basis for, um, uh, for example, damages and contracts as being a deterrent effect, it is worth bearing in mind that arbitration awards are confidential. And so there, there, there will be very, very little uh, public deterrent effect. There will clearly be a deterrent effect on the individual party that's violated the contract. Um, look, I'm, 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 a, I'm conscious of the short time. This is a tremendous book, which raises an enormous number of issues for discussion. I, I did just want to finish very briefly by touching on two points. The first is regulation. Uh, the book does discuss, importantly, statutory regimes for punitive civil remedies. Um, and I think that is a very important area. It's, it's an area which is developing around the world, including in Hong Kong, particularly in regulated activities and industries, consumer and public markets protection being at the forefront, you have statutory civil punishments. Um, I've always regarded regulation as a sort of kind of interstitial area, somewhere between formal law um, and, 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 uh, and, and party driven private law. Um, so I would like I would love to see more focus on the utility of regulation as a means to impose civil punishment. You can have civil fines, public reprimands, the removal of licenses where you require licenses, etc. So last, I would like to note the very recent trend of, of the introduction of new PRC national laws into Hong Kong as Hong Kong laws, uh, typically concerned with national security interests. Why am I raising this? Um, if you look at the prospect prospective prospect of a anti-foreign sanctions law in Hong Kong, which was currently being shelved, but who knows, it may come back next year. If you look at that law, it's likely to have both criminal elements, but also a, a compensatory civil claim element. The interesting thing, as, uh, to my mind, about PRC law, it's a civil code based law, is that it mixes and is never terribly clear about what is criminal and what is civil um, in, terms of, in terms of violations and obligations. That of itself, I think, is a, is a, is a, is a different dimension to this whole question. Overall, ex this is an exceptionally valuable legal work. Uh, I completely agree with Andrew Fang of the Supreme Court of Singapore, where he says it's a fine work of scholarship and will become one of the leading texts. It's already on my most prominent uh, bookshelf and I expect it to remain there for a long time to come. So I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to comment on the book and to have read it. Thank you very much, Martin, for your, uh, you know, complimentary, but also complimentary comments. You know, it's always great for academics if, the, if we see that our work resonates with, uh, you know, basically um, with practitioners and also can really make a difference in practice. Um, we've had a few questions and there's still a bit of time for us to, uh, you know, go into some of them. So the first question that I'd like to uh, um, read out is from uh, Neil Foster from the University of Newcastle. And he asks, um, and it's presumably a question for um, Elise, uh, does the book consider whether the aims of deterrence are undermined or negated due to the presence of insurance? Thanks a lot, Neil. That's a fantastic question. Uh, yes, there are a number of uh, chapters that discuss this. Um, in particular, Catherine Sharkey has a fantastic chapter on uh, punitive awards. And uh, in fact, she talks about them um, and their role as um, being conceptualised as um, actually co compensatory, but for broader societal harms, which can't be captured by um, uh, claims involving single parties, if you like. Um, and she talks a lot about, uh, for example, the role of uh, directors indemnities and, and those sorts of things, uh, which I think is um, partly going to uh, your question where, you know, you have uh, the situation where a um, defendant um, is not themselves going to be required to fork out um, the sum. Uh, that has been uh, imposed against them. Um, she uh, also combines this with a very interesting discussion of where those awards should be directed. 
uh, for example, should they go to the plaintiff or should they go to third third parties? And so she talks about um, American cases in which the awards have been used to support various charitable uh, bodies, for example, that have as their aim the prevention or remediation of the sorts of harms that have been uh, perpetrated by the defendant. Um, of course, in Australia, we uh, have cases where um, exemplary damages, for example, have been awarded in, in cases where effectively the defendant is the insurer. Um, but these still have um, strong deterrent, um, uh, general deterrent effects, even if not specific deterrent effects for the particular uh, defendant. So there is discussion of that. It's a very interesting question, though. I think really, certainly Jenny Patterson and I, in our final chapter, we talk about the sorts of uh, questions that remain outstanding and require further investigation. And we note that really there's there's hardly any empirical work that's been done to, for example, test the effectiveness of supposedly deterrent awards and you know how they are um, effective and the boundaries of um, sort of workability for awards. And, and your question would go precisely to that sort of lack of core evidence or information that we have currently. Thank you, Elise. You know, so uh, another question to, to Katie, also by uh, Neil. And that's whether, uh, Katie, whether you have any specific examples of the type of case where exemplary damages should be awarded for contract breach. Perhaps imagine the situation where a company sells funeral plans to an indigenous community and then later it just ignores the contracts and refuses to provide a service. Well, um, I have to say in that instance, I'd be feeling pretty punitive um, because I think that that is egregious and terrible. I mean, the question is, so um, I'm just going to turn to my table of cases where I have decided that they're were some cases. So there's the case of um, the famous one is white and pilot insurance, where what you have is breach of an insurance uh, contract. And um, the insurance company egregiously and knowingly breaches it, accuses the insured of fraud when they know it's not true, simply to avoid um, paying out on the policy. And then, um, you know, there's no way of calculating what that loss is really. So what the court does is they award $1 million in exemplary Canadian dollars in exemplary damages. The question I suppose in relation to, for example, the indigenous funeral um, things is, is there another award which could, because. James Edelman has described um, exemplary damages as the blunt axe um, as compared to the sharp axe of something like an account of profits. Is there some other kind of award which might be more appropriate? For example, in the Indigenous funeral thing, I kind of think, well, should we first off strip them of their profits and possibly in a kind of life plan like way they've got to prove <laughs> that they're entitled to any um, allowance for skill and effort and uh, we kind of make it quite obvious that that kind of behavior is disgusting. Um, I also take Martin's point so I've gone back to practice one day a fortnight recently and I've seen some terrible breaches of contract. Uh, there was one that was just appalling and you kind of think, mm, maybe, maybe, maybe I should be more generous than I was already. Um, in the end, we did find a sufficient labor to get what we wanted. But it was really, really bad, lying and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm trying to think of another case where I might have awarded exemplary damages. I think the Australian case of Harrison Digital Pulse, even though the New South Wales Court of Appeal declined to award um, exemplary damages, I might have done that. Um, other than that, I'm not able to think of many other cases where they were sought 
um, where they should have been awarded because either um, it was a kind of commercial dispute um, or it's not dishonest and fraudulent, there's no particular agency problem or there's some other remedy which is more appropriate. So it is going to be rare. But um, like Justice Pung, I still would um, not totally rule it out. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Katie, for your uh, response as well. Um, I'm looking at the time, you know, so I'd like to wrap up in time because uh, for many people it's their lunch break. So, uh, uh, so thank you again to all our speakers and to uh, the audience for your participation. It's been a wonderful session. It's been great, also that you know the uh, you know the work that uh, you know that you've uh, presented on and and that has been discussed, uh, you know, has such a you know an international resonance and is uh, you know basically of, of comparative value as well. So uh, thank you again to from all of us here at CHK. Thank you.